Hi, members. Good afternoon and welcome to our program today. We have Jennifer Hoey, a member of the Academy's Reefscape Genomics Lab, here to talk about coral reef biodiversity and the cutting edge technology she uses to study it. First, a little housekeeping. We're gonna do a Q&A with Jennifer at the end of her presentation with your questions. So please ask Jennifer questions by submitting them in the YouTube chat box to the right there. Um, if you need help setting that up and learning how to submit questions, there's a how-to in this description underneath the video. Feel free to drop your questions in the chat at any point and we'll come back to them at the end. Uh, so I would like to bring Jennifer to the program. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Um, she's one of the lab's postdoctoral researchers working on a project to learn how hybridization may give some corals an advantage in new environments and how combining 3D imaging with molecular tools can help us understand the past and future of coral evolution in a genus of Caribbean corals. So I think with that introduction over with, Jennifer, would you like to take it away? Sure. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, on this Thursday afternoon. And today I'm really excited to be telling you a little bit about what I'm working on for my postdoctoral research here at the California Academy of Sciences. So if you've ever been lucky enough to scuba dive or snorkel on a coral reef, you might have seen something like this. Um, lots of colors, lots of diversity, and lots of life. Um, and coral reefs like this uh, support billions of people, um, either through providing income, food, or protection. Um, and they're really important for the world in general. And so when we think about coral reefs, the major building blocks of coral reefs themselves are the corals. And so corals are cnidarians, which are related to jellyfish and sea anemones. And typically they are colonial. So they'll, they are made up of many organisms, um, sorry, many, uh, many individuals um, that form a colony and that have a calcium carbonate skeleton around themselves. And uh, corals also have a very special relationship with an algae. And so this coral algal symbiosis means that both the coral and their algae benefit from living together. And these algae actually live within the tissues of the coral host. Um, and so the coral is able to provide a nice home for these algae and provide it with nutrients um, and also metabolic byproducts that the algae then uses um, to create food for the coral through photosynthesis. And this food that the algae provides the coral makes up the majority um, of the food that the coral intakes. Um, and so as we study and learn more and more about corals, we're learning that there are other organisms um, that also play a role in coral health. So, all of these different organisms together, um, the coral host, the algae, um, also bacteria, fungi, um, endolithic algae, uh, archaea, and also viruses, these all form an assemblage, um, and we call this the coral holobiont. And so it's these interactions between all of these players in the holobiont um, that help impact and influence coral health and then also the health of the reef. Uh, but for my postdoc uh, here at the Cal Academy, I am most interested in the coral host itself and the capacity for corals to be able to adapt um, in changing in conditions. And so one really important process that evolutionary biologists study um, is the movement of genetic material between and amongst different populations and species. So for example, hybridization is when two genetically um, distinct species interbreed. And so in this example we have here, we can imagine that we've got a yellow 
coral species and a blue coral species. And if, in, if there's interbreeding between them and that's uh, successful, this will result in a hybrid individual. And this process is called hybridization. So we can actually think of hybridization as a double-edged sword. So on one side of the sword, um, it can be a negative. Um, and this is because when you have populations spread out across space, they're often in different kinds of environments. And these populations will adapt to match um, their particular environmental conditions. And so if hybridization happens, Sometimes this can be bad because this means that you'll lose that local adaptation for a specific environment. Um, and this results because you're breaking up beneficial gene combinations and overall homogenizing the gene pool. Another negative of hybridization can be reduced viability or fertility. Um, and the classic example of this is mules, which are sterile. So on the flip side, hybridization can actually be um, a really important evolutionary process. Uh, and this is because it can be a rapid way to introduce new genetic material into a population. Um, there are other ways to generate genetic diversity, um, such as through mutations, but oftentimes beneficial mutations don't arise that frequently. And sometimes, the, this process of generating new mutations can also be really slow. Um, so in contrast to mutations, hybridization can actually be a very fast way uh, to introduce new genetic material um, into a population and increase the genetic variation within that population. So, if we continue along in this example, um, if new genetic material from the yellow population is advantageous, natural selection will favor this genetic material. Um, and then individuals with genes from the yellow population will have higher fitness. And eventually over time, they will um, survive better and have more offspring, and that will increase the frequency of these yellow genes in the population. And so we can examine hybridization through this genetic lens, um, which is becoming easier and easier with molecular tools that are becoming cheaper um, to use. But then we can also examine hybridization by looking at um, different morphological characteristics uh, of these corals as well. And so that's something I'm really interested in trying to do during my postdoc here at the Cal Academy. Um, so in the real world, we have a few examples of where hybridization has actually allowed for this rapid evolution into new environments. So in this first example, um, the movement of genes between Atlantic killifish populations and Gulf killifish populations actually resulted in the evolution of pollution tolerance. And then in some other examples, um, hybridization between snowshoe hares and jackrabbits uh, resulted in the evolution of brown winter coats in mild winter environments. And in the sunflower example, hybridization resulted in adaptation to new environments, which sunflowers didn't exist in before, um, which was sand dunes. And so in all three of these examples, hybridization was actually facilitated by different environments being in close proximity to each other. So um, in the killifish example, it was an, an environmental gradient of pollution in a river. In the rabbit example, it's an environmental gradient of winter intensity and snowfall. And then in the sunflower example, it's uh, an environmental gradient of how um, well the water holds, sorry, how well the soil holds water. Um, and so I'm interested in looking at hybridization in this genus of corals called madrasis along a depth gradient. 
And so when we look at the ocean, uh, oftentimes we don't think of it as being very differentiated on the surface, um, but there are gradients that exist both across space. If you think about an ocean basin and ocean water in the tropics compared to more temperate areas, um, but then also um, in the vertical sense too, along depth. So when we think about a depth gradient, um, uh, we do our work in Curacao, which is kind of defined by these depth gradients. So here's a map of the Caribbean. Uh, and then Curacao is this little island in the Southern Caribbean, um, just north of Venezuela. And so when I'm talking about depth gradients in Curacao, uh, this is what a typical kind of shot of the ocean looks like um, when you're standing on the beach. And so this is actually one of our field sites. It's called Playa Calpi. And Curacao is surrounded by fringing coral reefs. Um, so that means that the coral reefs are very close to the shore. And that means that they're easily accessible. So we can actually just uh, swim out to our dive sites. And then something else in this photo that you'll notice is the very striking color um, change from kind of turquoise to dark blue, right about where that boat is. And so this color change is pretty typical of Curacao and reefs, and it's indicative of a steep drop off, um, which is the depth gradient that I'm referring to. And so we can actually go underwater now and go for a dive and see what this looks like. So here in this video, um, we're on scuba and the camera is just panning across the reef slope. Um, so you can see that the reef drops off quite dramatically um, and it continues to drop off out of sight of the camera and it might look a little bit darker to you than when it started off panning from the shallows. So along the step gradient, um, there's different environmental characteristics that kind of define the gradient. And so one very common and important um, environmental variable for corals is the amount of light. So here's a graph just showing how light varies with depth. So on the horizontal axis here, we have a measure of how much light there is. So over here on the left, it's less light. And then over here on the right is more light. And then on the vertical axis, we have uh, depth in meters going from zero to 50 meters. And so these curves, either in the white circles or the black circles are measurements of the amount of light at a, at a very uh, different depth. And so it's measuring light. Um, if it's the white circles, if you imagine this is a coral, light is being measured uh, perpendicular to the water's surface. And then if it's the black circles, light is being measured parallel to uh, the water surface at a coral head. And so you can see that either, either curve you're looking at, um, there's more light in the shallows. And so this is just an example of how an environmental variable can vary across the depth gradient. And kind of the terrestrial analogy of this would be if you've either driven or walked up a mountain. Um, if you've done that, you may have noticed that the environment changed as you went up and down the mountain. For example, um, it might be a nice temperature kind of near the bottom of the mountain. And then when you got to the top of the mountain, it might have been very cold. So also that temperature difference or gradient along a mountain is also another example, um, similar example to what you might find in the ocean. Um, and Similar to a mountain, you might expect different uh, flora and fauna to live at the base of the mountain versus the top of the mountain. And this is also true in the ocean too. So for my corals, um, the distribution 
of these various species varies by depth. And so in this schematic here, um, we again have depth on the vertical axis from five meters to 60 meters. And then that the width of the polygon basically is showing you the relative abundance of each of these particular madrasa species. So just to introduce you to the different madrasa species, um, the first is called Madrasus mirabilis, and it's often found in the shallows, and it makes really huge beds um, that kind of dominate wherever it is. Uh, this is also called yellow pencil coral or yellow finger coral, um, and it's usually only found in the shallows. Next, we have Madrasa stachactus. Um, this species doesn't form the huge beds that Mirabilis does, but it looks kind of similar. Um, it looks like it also has fingers, but the tips of the fingers are a little more swollen. Um, and this is found in the shallows, but then also around 30 meters in depth. Other species are Madrasus formosa, which is primarily found quite deep. Um, and it's kind of more flattened and has kind of a lobey look to it. And then another similar looking species is Madrasus carmabi, um, which is only kind of in this intermediate depth range around 30 meters. Um, we have Madrasus scenaria, which lives along the entire depth gradient and it forms, it can form, it's either encrusting or it forms like little pillars and it looks very distinct from the other corals in the Madrasus genus. And then finally, we have Madrasus forensis, um, which you can see is quite common um, in all of the depth range. Uh, and it's also very diverse in terms of the colors you might see and also its shapes. So it can be encrusting to kind of be elevated um, off the surface. It can be purple, it can be green, it can be brown. Um, and so it has a lot of different kind of shapes and colors. And so these um, species are based off of what uh, they, these corals look like. Um, but we know from work that I will talk about that sometimes that's not always the case. And so just keep in mind that these, what we're categorizing as these different species are based on visual observations. And so if you remember, we can look at hybridization both from looking at these visual characteristics, but also genetically. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we might investigate hybridization using genetics. And so this is a hypothetical example. Um, using computer software where we tried to define the number of populations genetically based on um, sequencing data. And so in this example, um, each of these little bars represents a unique individual and the color proportion of contained within each of the bars um, represents the genetic ancestry uh, of a particular group. So in this example, um, we either have blue, orange, or green, and the ordering of the bars is up to the user. So we can pretend that perhaps all of these individuals are the same species, or they were sampled from the exact same location, um, or something like that. And so if we do some sequencing and we run this analysis, which is often called a structure or an admixture analysis, um, if we get this kind of output, we know that there's no population structure and that there's no gene flow happening between either these species or these um, individuals sampled from two or three different groups or sites. Um, 
But in reality, this it's often much more complicated. So here's an example for madrasis um, using a limited set of genetic markers. And there's a lot going on on here, so I'll walk you guys through it. Um, but again, we've grouped uh, colonies together based on what we think their identity is visually. So got Madrasis carmabi, Decactus, Formosa, Mirabilis, Francis, and Scenaria. And then the color proportions of the bars um, help give us a general idea of any interesting patterns that might be happening. So for example, Madrasis Scenaria, we see all the ones that we um, categorized as being Madrasis Scenaria, are, they're all blue. So they're quite distinct from anything that's not Scenaria. Um, Madrasis to Cactus, you can see all of the ones that look visually like Madrasis to Cactus are mostly this magenta color. Um, so that also suggests that they are quite distinct from any of the other Madrasis species. For Madrasus formosa and Madrasus mirabilis, um, things start to get a little more interesting. You'll notice that for Madrasus formosa, most of them are the some combination of uh, gold and green, um, but there's this one very curious individual that has many different colors. Um, so that one could potentially be a hybrid. And then for Madrasus mirabilis, we probably have some um, unrecognized population structure going on here because some individuals are completely orange and some are this combination of kind of pink and orange or pink and uh, orange and red. And then if we look at Madrasus carmabi, uh, we notice several things going on. Um, first, there are carmabi looking individuals that are pretty unique. They're entirely green from the rest of the madrasas. We also have ones that look like Carmabi, but genetically they look more like Madrasis to Cactus. So they're probably misidentified just based on what they look like visually. And then we have these two individuals here, which are some combination of purple, green, and yellow. And so there might be something going on, interesting, interesting going on with those individuals. And then finally, if we look at Madrasus forensis, um, remember this is the one that has a diversity of morphology and colors. So of the colonies that we think are forensis visually, there are some, this purple color, that are distinct from the rest of the Madrasus. There are also others that were probably misidentified. Um, these ones that genetically look like the cactus or for example, this one that looks genetically like Carmabi um, or Scenaria here with the blue. But there are a few, this one, this one, and this one, where something interesting is probably going on. And there's, it looks like it's probably hybridization based on this and other follow-up analyses. And so um, this is kind of unpublished preliminary data and I want to take a deeper look at this using many more samples um, of madrasas across a wider geographic area. And so the big questions for my postdoc are, what are the genomic patterns of hybridization in madrasas across the entire genome? Um, how does morphology vary amongst hybrids and parental species? And then something I'd also like to get into um, is trying to understand if th this hybridization is potentially advantageous at all. And so to start to tackle these questions, uh, I traveled with the Reefscape Genomics Lab to Curacao in the spring. Um, and so this is most of our team here. This is Ale, she's another postdoc in the lab. Both Floor and Dennis um, were master's students in the lab who have either recently graduated or will soon graduate. Uh, this is me. 
Here's Mark, who's one of our dive safety officers at the Academy. And then this is Pim, who's the head of the Reefscape Genomics Lab. And um, if you're interested in keeping tabs on what we're up to, you're welcome to follow us on Twitter at Reefscape Genomics, or we have a website too. And so in April, we traveled down to Curacao. Uh, this is just a reminder of where it is again. And the Reefscape Genomics Lab um, has developed monitoring sites along the leeward side of Curacao. So these are the seven sites uh, that we've developed. And the beauty of these sites is that we can go back to them year after year. And so at these seven sites, we have plots of reef uh, that we monitor and refine from year after year. And these plots are approximately 25 meters in length and four meters wide. And we have them at depths of 5, 10, 20, 40, and 60 meters. Um, and so by having plots at between the uh, depth range of 5 to 60 meters, where some are in shallow water and some are in mesophotic depths. And through this depth range, we're able to capture different environmental gradients that exist um, throughout this depth range. Um, and so I mentioned that we can return to these sites year after year. And that is really nice in itself because then we can track individual colonies that exist in the reef, revisit them, see how they're doing, um, and then combine that with genomic analyses and other types of data to better understand coral reef biodiversity. And so the core of our work really exists in being able to make these 3D models um, of each of our plots over time. So to do this, we refine the exact same spot in the reef. And we know it's the exact same spot in the reef because we've marked the reef with cattle tags. Um, and so we'll go to a site, we'll swim out to where we think the cattle tags are, go underwater, and then look for the cattle tags. And then we'll lay a transect to connect the cattle tags. And so in this video here, um, we've already found all the cattle tags and we've laid out the transect. And so when we image these plots of reef, we have a large camera, which is the thing on the front and it's attached to a scooter and it takes a photo every second. So that's what you're seeing when the strobes go off. And we swim this camera back and forth along the length of tr the transect several times. Um, and then we'll bring all those photos back here to the academy. And we use computers to stitch all those photos together. And then we end up with something like this. So here you're looking at one of our reconstructed reef plots um, from the top down. And so if you start to look carefully, you can start to see, for example, the transect along the middle of the plot. Um, you can also start to see individual coral colonies or sponges, for example, like this bright orange one. Um, and kind of similar to the collections that we have here at the Cal Academy, um, specimen collections, you can think of these reef plots as digital collections or digital snapshots of what the reef looked like at a particular moment in time. And we have similar images um, also going back in time. So we can see what the reef looked like um, right now, for example, and then what it looked like a year prior. Um, and then in combination with these 3D models, we also take coral tissue samples from within the plots. So this is me taking a sample. Um, you'll notice I'm wearing a head mounted camera here that documents what I'm doing. And when I find a coral I want to sample, I use some pliers to cut off a little piece. Um, 
which allows the coral to still live in its environment. And we just take a very small subsample of tissue. And so I'll just play it again. Um, when I'm underwater, I will signal to my dive buddy which tube it's going into. They take the sample. Um, it's usually very small, something like a few millimeters in length. And then use the forceps to put it in the appropriate tube in this tray that I wear on my arm. And so uh, I sampled tissue from Madrasa's colonies. And then we also took standardized macro photos of each of the colonies that I sampled. Um, and so by using the tissue samples, I'll be able to look at hybridization from the genetic perspective. And then by taking these macro photos, I can start to see if there might be um, any potential morphological differences in the hybrids that I find from the genetic data. And I can see if there may be particular characteristics are intermediate between parental species and stuff like that. So uh, these four photos are just examples of some of the macro photos that we took for uh, Madrasa's corals that I actually sampled. And so you can just start to see some of the diversity of shapes and um, morphologies and colors that exist within madrasas. And so when I come out of the water from a dive, I will transfer the samples that I have from the tray on my arm into individually labeled tubes full of ethanol. So that preserves the coil tissue. And then we bring all those samples back to San Francisco here. Um, and so the summer, after we got back from Curacao, I spent most of the summer extracting DNA from all of these tissue samples. And so here's a table summary of what I did over the summer and what we collected. Um, so in all, uh, we collected over 750 corals and I extracted DNA for all of these corals. Um, the numbers are broken down by our seven different sites and then also by depth. So for some sites, you'll notice that maybe 20 or 30 corals were collected. Um, so this is, will be able to give us kind of a broad picture of population structure and kind of what's going on at the scale of the island of Curacao. And then for other sites, Coral Estate, uh, Kalki, and Snake Bay, we sampled more intensively across the entire depth range from five to 60 meters. And so these sites in particular will be really important for um, understanding how hybridization might be happening um, throughout this depth range and which um, species potentially are involved. Um, and so actually I'm really excited to say that as of yesterday, I dropped off, it was about, it was nearly 700 DNA extracts to the sequencing center at Davis. So the next step is that they'll make the coral extracts into DNA libraries, which will then be put on the sequencer. So you'll have to come back to another Cal Academy event so I can tell you about some of the results once the sequencing data um, comes back. But while we wait, um, another thing that's been happening is that, remember I was wearing that head-mounted camera uh, while diving, so I've been working with a master's student in Italy named Giorgio, and he's been helping me by re-watching um, all the footage and actually marking where in the 3D models all of the samples come from. So in this little movie here, you're just seeing what our 3D model looks like. Our 3D model of the reef is just a huge collection of points. Um, and you can see that we can manipulate it and view it from different angles. Um, and each of these points has the X, Y, Z coordinate. And so Giorgio has been re-watching my underwater footage and then marking where in the 3D model um, 
corresponds to a colony that I sampled. And so this will actually allow us to um, track individual madrasas colonies over time by like overlaying the 3D models on top of each other. Um, or we can also associate any genetic data for these samples with environmental characteristics. Um, for example, how exposed the particular colony might be. Um, and then just another visualization of how combining the 3D models with um, coral, coral data uh, can go. Um, so in this little video here, it just shows again how we image the reef, how this gets turned into a 3D model, and then how we annotate where particular colonies are, and then how we can basically resurvey and recreate um, these snapshots of reef at different points in time. And so you'll notice that if you watch the particular um, coral here, you can see that in 2019, it, it looked great. February 2020, it looked great. And then we had a bleaching event later in 2020. So you can actually see the effects of that bleaching event on these same colonies. And so if we continue the time series, we can see which of these colonies recovered, which ones didn't, if that's related to genetics at all. Um, and it helps us get a better understanding of who, like which corals might do better, um, which ones we might want to pay more attention to, uh, and then how these processes uh, might help us conserve corals um, in the future. And so another thing that's in the pipeline um, is to analyze these macrophotos. So something that I would like to do um, soon is to quantify these fine scale morphological characteristics um, and then combine that with the genetic data that we will be getting. So examples of morphological characteristics that I'm aiming to look at are things like the density of individual coral colonies, um, coralites on the colony, um, the number of septa, which are these like little teeth formations on the edge of a coralite, and then also aspects of how big uh, the coralite is. And so just to wrap up, I wanted to summarize a few of the main points um, that I hope you'll walk away with today. So the first is that the Reefscape Genomics Lab at the California Academy of Sciences uses both 3D photogrammetry and also uh, genomic sequencing technology to understand coral reef biodiversity. And it's really by integrating these different perspectives um, that we're able to kind of have a more robust picture of what's going on in the reef. For my postdoc project, I'm studying hybridization in madrasas corals using both genetics and then also looking at morphology. And I think hybridization is a really interesting and important way um, that genes can move around between populations and species. And so even though it can sometimes be detrimental, it can also be a rapid way of kind of injecting new genetic material into a population. And so evolutionarily, this is really important because genetic diversity is the basis for evolving in a changing world. And so by understanding how genetic diversity is moving between and among different um, populations or species, we can get a better handle on um, what, what happened in the past, but how that also might translate into the future as corals and coral reefs are facing new challenges. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um,
you can also feel free to email me or follow me on Twitter if you'd like. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, fascinating work. I think I wrote when I was listening to you in my notes, like organization, because I'm just thinking about all those samples, keeping track, all the annotation. I mean, like how much, you know, if you think of your job as being like, okay, so Jennifer's going to the field and diving, collecting samples, or she's in the lab spitting out, you know, these genomes, but how much is just like organization and note keeping and note taking. And do you like that part of the work? <laughs> I've learned that note taking, I think in any aspect of science is extremely important. Um, and it, if you take good notes, it'll save you a lot of headaches further down the line. So I think I'm always learning or like trying to be better at taking notes and just kind of documenting what I did because even some little thing that you might write down in the field, um, like while you're underwater, for example, could be really handy for kind of solving a problem further down the mm. line. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do like, yeah, I do like it because if you stay organized, it makes your life way easier. Um, but yeah, many aspects to think about when like trying to write notes underwater and then <laughs> yeah. things get crazy in the field and it's really easy to lose those kinds of uh, details. And so, yeah, super important to somehow document and preserve it and make it available for everyone so that if there is a problem, it's easier to solve. Yeah, I was wondering if members of your lab and your collaborators kind of have a similar system so you can interpret each other's notes if if needed. Do you yeah. agree on that? Um, so in the Reefscape Genomics Lab, we have a bunch of shared documents that we all work on um, just to try to help keep track of decisions that we made along the way. Mm -hmm. And then also um, like writing what metadata means is also really important. Right. So you might have a huge spreadsheet, but then having another tab to document like what each of those headers is, is also really important. Wow. And so it's just kind of developing a system within each lab that works for everyone in the lab. Yeah. So now that we've talked about the glamour side of science work, um, how do you decide which corals to sample from when you're diving? And also how long underwater did it take to get 763 samples? Um, so when I went to Curacao this spring, it felt really daunting to me because I'd actually mm -hmm. never seen any of my corals like live oh. underwater before. So I, ha I saw pictures online mm -hmm. of what they looked like, but it's totally different from scuba diving and trying to identify things underwater. And so the first few dives, was just like getting to know the sites, observing, mm -hmm. like pointing out corals and then either being told like, those are madrasas or those are not madrasas. Um, so it, for me, it felt like a huge learning curve to kind of gain that uh, visual recognition of what they looked like. Um, and so when we went in the field, because I didn't know what they looked like, we decided we would anything that looked like madrasas, <laughs> and eventually I got better at IDing them. Um, anything that looked like madrasas when the, within the plots, we were going to sample. And so we talked about that as our team because we had shallow divers and we had deep divers, and we talked about how we were going to sample in a similar way. Um, mm -hmm. And that helped us stay on track. And then in terms of time, we were in Curacao for a, about a month and we were doing oh, wow. usually two dives a day. Um, 
So I think if I'm remembering correctly, I added up all the minutes I spent underwater and I think it was something like 36 hours, but that was just for me. That was just for me. Um, so I'm not sure what it is like for all 700 of those. Um, but roughly you can times 36 hours by the number of people on our expedition, which range from like mm -hmm. six to seven. Wow. Wow. Um, and so for, for those of us who don't, you know, work in genetics normally, um, you mentioned that your samples yesterday, right? You gave them to UC Davis for their lab and you, and you mentioned something about you're gonna get DNA libraries that you're then gonna put in a sequencer. And so obviously these results don't spit out like those beautiful colored bar charts that you showed us. Um, what do you get and how do you interpret them? So when you make DNA, DNA libraries, you're essentially getting the DNA ready um, to go on the sequencer. So oftentimes that means chopping up the DNA into like manageably long, like usually they're quite short actually, but um, it's like small chunks of DNA that the sequencer can deal with. And then once the libraries are done, they get put on the sequencer and the sequencer does its work. And then you'll get back a huge data file basically that just has all of these reads um, by uh, kind of like organized by whatever lane uh, the data was run on. And then it's your job to use a computer to make sense of all those raw sequences. So usually the sequences are only like 100 to 150 base pairs in length, because that's what most sequencers can, the length they can read. Mm -hmm. um, and so using a bunch of different tools and software, you piece that all back together. You try to, you like clean up the sequences. Um, you assign sequences based on, like during the library prep, you basically attach like a first and a last name to that chunk of DNA so you know that it's from a particular colony. And then you can tell the computer to kind of group all of those uh, reads with the same first and last name into a group. And so you have all these yeah. different piles that are belong to a particular colony. Um, and then you can align it to a reference genome, um, and then once you've done that, then you can start looking for these like single base pair differences that exist across individuals. Yeah. And so once you have that file, then wow. you can do a whole bunch <laughs> of stuff, all kinds of analyses to look at population structure, how much gene flow is going on between the different populations, what are the populations, who's hybridizing with who, um, <laughs> and then a bunch of other stuff too. Yeah, so that's like the winter portion of your work. Yeah. Then not in the field. Yeah. During summer vacation, you're you're diving. Um, how often are you? I mean, there's such a there's such uh, diversity in the the morphology of your of even like some of the singular species, right? So how often are you surprised by the results? Um, so I. I think this will be easier to answer once the mm -hmm. genetic data come back, because um, then we'll be able to actually see like, oh, that one that we think might be a Dicactus, what does it look like genetically? Mm -hmm. um, and so that structure or admixture plot I showed for Madrasis, um, those samples weren't collected in our plots. And so, yeah by collecting madrasas in our plots, like in a more standardized way across the step gradient, um, mm -hmm. it should be easier to tell like how common hybrids are in this particular area. Um, and 
we'll just have a better sense of like how common they are. Um, and so I think that will be really revealing, but based on that structure admixture plot that I showed, um, mm -hmm. like you wouldn't think hybrids would be too common, but also mm -hmm. not that many individuals were sampled for that study and still we find ones that seem to be hybrids. Mm -hmm. So we think that it might be quite common in madrasas, um, but in general, you probably won't expect that many hybrids to be around. Yeah. Um, and then quick one more question, because that made me think of, of things I was thinking at the beginning of your talk is, yeah, is madrasas unique in how much it hybridizes or has it been seen as common? Like is hybridization common in other coral species as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So hybridization has been documented in other corals, um, but oftentimes, well, I guess one thing is, is that with it being easier to sequence many individuals, we don't quite have that great of a sense yet of how common it might be in other coral species. Mm -hmm. And so for Madrasis, previous genetic work that's been done, like the early, early studies only used a few genetic markers and they still found evidence of high potential hybridization. And so the structure admixture plot that I showed used many more markers than those early studies. Um, but that's still only a very small subset of the entire genome for a colony, for example. So I think we don't quite know yet, but my impression is that for madrasas, like it, it probably falls on the more extreme end of um, hybridization being more common, but mm -hmm. we still have to quantify it for madrasas and other coral species to know for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then one more question that I just saw come in um, is somebody is asking, what program and techniques were used to make the 3D models? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so this is something I'm going to start kind of delving more into, because uh, mostly up until now, I've just been focusing mostly on the genetic uh, mm -hmm. component. But one of the programs we use um, to at least visualize the 3D models once they're made um, is called Viscore. And it was okay. made by, it's like a proprietary software made by a group um, at UCSD specifically for doing these kinds of 3D models for underwater. Um, but uh, one of the programs, that, so the program that I've been using with the master student I've been working with in Italy, we've been using a program that's open source and free and it's called Cloud Compare. So okay. that allows us to visualize the 3D models. They're not quite as like crisp as what you might um, look at if you looked at it in Viscore, but it's at least good enough to, for our purposes of trying to identify where in the reef um, particular colonies are. Great, thank you. That's exciting that you're, that you're gonna delve into it. Um, you have a lot of work ahead. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're very excited to hear about it. So it'd be great if you, yeah, came back once you once you have results and have had some time with them um, to give us an update on how many of these corals are hybridizing. For sure, I would love that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for listening. Um, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for being here this afternoon. And thank you so much for your ongoing support as members. We have one final virtual member talk this year called that we're titling the Solstice Sea Star Search. Say that 10 times fast. Um, and that's actually the title of a new iNaturals project or event um, that our community science team has put together. 
Um, and so the co-directors of community science, Allison Young and Rebecca Johnson will be here next week to talk about why we want you to go out to the tide pools during your holiday break and look for sea stars. So um, with that, I'm going to end the stream and wish everyone a very happy rest of your days. And thanks again. Bye.